lights, camera, action. Okay. You're watching Food as Medicine TV. This is our interview series, and today we're talking about a little known topic is what about when ADD is not actually what you think it is? Attention Deficit Disorder. What about when it's not what you think it is? Here with me today is Dr. Christina Chambers. She is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Family and Preventative Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. She is also the director of clinical research at Rady Children's Hospital, amongst a whole host of other things. Dr. Chambers, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This is a very important topic and one that was brand new to me, which is why I wanted to bring it to our tribe. You are a perinatal epidemiologist, mm -hmm. so explain to us what that means and the primary focus of your research. So epidemiologist, uh, you sort of think of those as a, a person who studies something like Ebola virus. Mm -hmm. uh, they're um, researchers who try to understand uh, how disease occurs by person, place, and time. And I focus on um, prenatal uh, exposure, so things that happen uh, during a mom's pregnancy um, that could be from the environment, could be medications that she takes, could be substances she uses, and whether or not they can interfere with the normal development of the baby. Which is so important. You're protecting and researching a pioneer for future generations. Absolutely. And the, the preeminence of your work these last few years has been in diagnosing fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and studying it. Is that right? That's a huge area of emphasis for our group. And the reason is uh, that it is the most common exposure um, mm -hmm. thing that a mother is exposed to during pregnancy that can be harmful to the baby. Yes, so, so dive into that a little bit because it says that uh, FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, you guys, not fetal alcohol syndrome, and that it's the leading preventable cause of birth defects and intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. Yet, obviously, it's completely avoidable. Mm -hmm. um, how common is it? Mm -hmm. And how is it diagnosed mm -hmm. since this, this is new to us? I know Dr. Jones has been researching it and putting it out there since the early 70s, mm -hmm. but it still feels like it hasn't hit the mainstream yet. Yes, it's, um, it's been a sort of an uphill struggle to get it recognized. Um, and it is not so easy to recognize it for what it is mm -hmm. um, in, you know, in the general population. We've just completed a study in the U.S. for the first time, kind of looking at this more comprehensively across four different communities uh, in the U.S. And we've come up with a minimum prevalence of about 1 to 5 percent of regular first grade children um, in uh, public and private schools who have something on the spectrum of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and that's as common or more common than autism spectrum disorders and yet this is a disorder that is very likely to go unrecognized um, certainly in early childhood and, and oftentimes is misdiagnosed so you mentioned earlier as ADD, ADD, ADD that children can have learning difficulties and behavior problems but it, the actual preventable cause um, of alcohol consumption in pregnancy is not recognized. So that's quite a large percentage, one to four percent of first graders that you studied. Mm -hmm. And these were a variety, these four communities were a mm -hmm. variety nationwide. Yes, uh, more rural communities uh, and urban communities as well. So mm -hmm. the sites were chosen because they represented sort of a diverse cross-section of the United States. Right, a good demographic. And so then how are, I know there's physical attributes mm -hmm. to diagnose FASD, mm -hmm. but the primary seems mm -hmm. to be the intellectual and intellectual behavioral behavior. attributes. Absolutely. So it's one of the uh, sort of uh, challenges mm -hmm. uh, in pediatrics is to a uh, have enough expertise on the part of pediatricians to be able to recognize the physical features. And the physical features are some very subtle minor facial features mm -hmm. um, that a child with a full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome would have. Mm -hmm. um, so little differences about the mouth and the and the length of the opening of the eye. Mm -hmm. um, the growth deficiency, the kids can have uh, have small heads, be shorter and uh, uh, smaller in terms of weight. 
Um, but as you say, the biggest and key feature of this is that alcohol affects brain development and that translates to intellectual and behavioral problems. But the biggest issue is if, especially if the child doesn't have the physical features. Most of them don't, And most right? of them don't. Most of them don't have the physical, so just you should go by the intellectual. And, the, and we do know there are certain kinds of types of intellectual impairment and certain types of behavioral um, impairments that children are more likely to have if they've had prenatal alcohol exposure, but you really need to know whether the mother drank. And sometimes that's a real hard piece of information to ask about, and it's a, and it's a hard piece of information to get the woman to respond honestly about. Um, there's sort of a stigma surrounding that, and it oh, leads to underdiagnosis and misdiagnosis. Well, you love your child so much, you yeah. never want to admit that you, d you weren't thinking you were harming them at the time. Exactly. And so everything that we do is, you know, okay, how do we correct and continue? Mm -hmm. First thing is you've got to identify what the cause is. Mm -hmm. and, and so it sounds like once you do, like what are the behavioral or intellectual signs of FASD in children? Or um, adults, right? Adults yes. go oh, undiagnosed. Ab absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's a lifelong disorder. Um, mm -hmm. There are some characteristic sort of uh, um, uh, intellectual problems, things, deficits in what we call executive functioning. Um, so kind of difficulty understanding the consequences of behavior. So if you do this, then this will happen. Mm -hmm. um, children with this disorder have some difficulty understanding what the consequences of behavior will be. So that, of course, can lead to um, difficulty in problem solving, but certainly difficulty in getting along with others, responding to directions from a teacher, and then farther down the line certainly can uh, lead to a higher chance that the child will have trouble with the law and not understanding sure. consequences of behavior. Um, and trouble then, with alcohol? And trouble with substance abuse. Substance and abuse yeah. and, and just wanting that. Is it more towards the instant gratification seeking that? Um, I, I think uh, poor impulse control certainly is a part of it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, okay, so the Institute of Medicine, this was shocking to me, has said that of all substances of abuse, including cocaine, heroin, and marijuana, alcohol produces by far the most serious neurobehavioral effects in the fetus. What is it mm -hmm. about alcohol specifically that makes mm -hmm. it so dangerous to pregnancy more than these, mm -hmm. you know, unbelievable narcotics? Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that's a really important point to make because the sort of knee-jerk reaction is to think, well, of course, heroin or cocaine has you're to be. You're like, it's grapes, a yeah. glass of wine. How yeah. could that be worse? Exactly. And, you know, I, I kind of think of an analogy just because a drug, a, a recreational drug or a street drug, is, um, can be harmful or addictive and uh, cause harm to the adult doesn't necessarily mean that it interferes with normal development of the baby. Mm -hmm. So if you think of a medication, we have, we have lots of medications that work therapeutically for the mom. Um, and don't cross the placenta. Th that do cross the placenta work per perfectly therapeutically for the mom. So for example, thalidomide mm -hmm. works very well to treat certain types of diseases, mm -hmm. but if you take it in pregnancy, it's helping the mother but causes birth defects in the baby. Right. So just because a, a, a drug um, is or is not harmful in the mother doesn't necessarily mean that it is or is not harmful in the baby. Alcohol, for whatever reason, um, is toxic to the developing baby. Mm -hmm. um, we don't fully understand yet what the mechanisms are, why it interferes with brain development, but we know that it does, mm -hmm. and we know that it does in very specific ways. And um, it is, uh, as the IOM says, uh, far and away um, the most potent human teratogen that we know of in terms of uh, prevalence of use and, mm -hmm. and how it can harm the baby. And I did in, in read in Dr. Jones's research how the blood alcohol content of the mother mm -hmm. is exactly the same as the blood alcohol content of the baby. So it's mm -hmm. not like if mom feels the effects, so, so does baby. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about what we, what we can do. Mm -hmm. You find out a child has FASD, what types of interventions can be done yes. to yes. offset so, that? Uh, absolutely. The first step 
towards helping that child is to know what it what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so be dealing with the with the correct uh, diagnosis. And obviously, as with any um, uh, neurobehavioral disorder, the earlier you can find out, the better. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can know, you know, from day one, uh, the kinds of interventions that you can um, initiate that can help while the brain is still fairly. Plastic. One of them is a, a math interactive learning paradigm, which uh, helps the child kind of break down uh, uh, problem solving into smaller chunks uh, so they can deal with it better, and that's been shown to be successful. And that provides transferable skills for life of yeah, problem solving exactly. and executive function. Exactly. It doesn't just work for math. It works across the um, other kinds of, of learning abilities in school. Um, there's another uh, behavior uh, modification um, intervention called GOFA. Uh, that's been tested and is now being rolled out um, to a little bit broader audience that kind of helps the child uh, modulate uh, their own behavioral decisions. Mm. Um, it's it's a, a computer game. And there are, people have been testing things like exercise. Um, there have been a couple of, of clinical trials of a nutrition intervention, specifically with choline, uh, one of the B vitamins, mm -hmm. uh, which animal studies have suggested should work um, to help ameliorate some of the effects of alcohol. Uh, so the, um, uh, one of the trials uh, with younger children showed some, some promising uh, results, and they're now repeating it um, in an in a age range of about two to three years of age uh, to see if they can get some benefit um, even after the prenatal exposure has already taken place. And that helps rejuvenate the um, neurochemical messengers in the brain? You know, I don't think it's understood what the mechanism is um, except for in the animal models, um, they seem to get a different benefit depending on when you give it. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you uh, give it in what's the equivalent of, of um, uh, adolescence, you get a different effect on some types of learning ability then you would and you would expect that mm -hmm. uh, you would get you get a different benefit if you take it at a, at a younger age or give it at a younger age so that's still being explored as a possible opportunity and there are other pharmacologic agents people are really interested in if there if there mm -hmm. are uh, neuroprotective or other types of medications that might help the child deal with the behavior problems and the cognitive problems as well mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a nice approach between holistic and allopathic mm -hmm. Okay, well that's promising and we'll provide links to all of this research in the blog. Um, okay, so now a woman is pregnant, right? Uh, I am here at 37 weeks pregnant. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's telling. So what role does a woman's nutritional status, how mm -hmm. resourced she is going into pregnancy, mm -hmm. have on her developing baby if she drank before she knew she was pregnant? Because mm -hmm. we hear that all the time. You weren't trying to get pregnant, and sometimes mm -hmm. alcohol helps you get pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so women say, oh, I've had maybe four or six drinks or mm -hmm. eight drinks, something like that, mm -hmm. in the month before they found out they were pregnant. Mm -hmm. Extremely well, common. Right. Yeah. It's the, as, as probably not you, but more than half of pregnancies aren't planned and half of women do drink some alcohol. So it's right. very, very common to have that exposure occur early in pregnancy. We're very interested in the role of nutrition. We know with um, t all kinds of um, t uh, toxins or things that a mother can be exposed to that uh, um, uh, can cause birth defects, that there are other factors that modulate that effect. Mm -hmm. So not 100% of babies are affected even if you take the most noxious thing. Um, so there's certainly probably genetic uh, susceptibility, so there's hu sure. human variation on, on that. Um, uh, Part of it, um, but there are also other things about the health of the mom that make her more or less at risk, and nutrition we think is an important one of those. Um, it, in terms of alcohol, it stands to reason that if you're consuming alcohol in lieu of other calories that you may not be getting... Um, you're creating of, deficiencies. Exactly, mm -hmm. you may not be getting the nutrients you need, and what mm -hmm. is optimum for a woman who is doesn't drink alcohol may not be good enough for a woman who does drink alcohol. So in mm -hmm. terms of additional nutritional needs that she's created because of having to metabolize this alcohol. So we think being in, in um, 
uh, optimal or best uh, nutritional status is the most important thing that you can do, mm -hmm. um, or one of the most important things other than quitting drinking alcohol um, uh, before pregnancy, ideally. Um, and we've got some evidence from some work that we've been doing in Eastern Europe um, that even after the alcohol exposure has taken place, um, that um, taking the uh, prenatal vitamins or whatever source that you uh, get nutrients from, mm -hmm. that that can actually uh, seems to help ameliorate some of the cognitive deficits, um, at least looking at very young children. So we've seen a benefit for, um, among women who um, do take uh, the prenatal vitamins that they've been prescribed on a regular basis throughout the rest of pregnancy in terms of improving outcomes for those children. Which really speaks to the power of the human body and Absolutely. survival, and uh, I love it. And we, we recommend, uh, my research was in fertility and prenatal health mm -hmm. several years ago. We always recommend a three-month preconception cleanse uh, and detox and that you're at least building your full leg stores absolutely. up for 60 to 90 days prior to. So absolutely. If, you're, if you've already been eating well and, and this happens, not to worry, but if you find out you're pregnant and you haven't been taking great care of yourself, mm -hmm. just start with where you are in that moment, absolutely. get on those wonderful prenatals and, mm -hmm. and bump up your nutrition. Absolutely. I like that. Okay, so can you tell me about some global research that you've done? We talked about choline, mm -hmm. but on other nutritional supplements. This is, that's always fascinating for me and how those other supplements impact outcomes. So this, the uh, uh, you mentioned folate, and obviously folate is the, um, the magic bullet, the biggest discovery, I think, of our century in terms of prevention of birth defects. Um, yes. That, that uh, having sufficient folate on board mm -hmm. um, in the first few weeks of pregnancy um, seems to be highly protective for a certain type of birth defect, neural tube defects. Um, yes. Spina bifida is probably one that people are most familiar with. Um, we we have looked at nutritional status in mothers um, who drink alcohol, pretty heavy amounts of alcohol in this study I mentioned in Eastern Europe, um, and it's also being looked at in South Africa and a couple of other places in the world. Um, we do see some differences um, in mothers who are consuming uh, heavy amounts of alcohol. Um, Could you define yeah. heavy amounts of alcohol? Oh, good, good question. Um, Typically, um, well, it's defined by um, the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control for women mm -hmm. um, as uh, being a certain number of drinks per week. Um, so uh, more than 14 drinks per week um, oh would be a, a heavy amount of alcohol. Mm -hmm. In terms of pregnancy, though, mm -hmm. we think the riskiest pattern is mm -hmm. drinking in a binge pattern. And by that, I mean drinking three, four, five drinks per occasion. Mm -hmm. So rather than spreading them out over a week, drinking on a Friday and Saturday night, for example. So those 10 drinks on a Friday and Saturday night would, would be much more uh, potentially harmful to the developing baby then than drinking. Drink Day or yeah, something. yeah, one or two drinks every day. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I mean by heavy alcohol drinking in that binge pattern mm -hmm. and drinking somewhere uh, uh, two or three times a week. Um, and I pattern. think that's helpful for a lot of viewers because mm -hmm. you know we always recommend an 80-20 balance of uh -huh. the way we live our life in general, the whole journey, and that includes th keeping alcohol to three to five drinks a week mm -hmm. when you're not pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, because there's I you know some women are thinking, and we hear a lot, and mm -hmm. we've had friends say, okay, in late term pregnancy. Pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I'm taking you on a different no, tangent no. for a second, but in late term pregnancy, third trimester, mm -hmm. um, you know, organogenesis has happened, mm -hmm. and can I have a couple glasses of wine here and there? Mm -hmm. And that's when a lot of a lot of women seem to think that's okay. And that is such misinformation. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, speak to it. Yeah, I think they uh, for a lot of things that we worry about effects of on the developing embryo or baby, you're talking about effects on structure um, of an organ like the heart. So mm -hmm. if you take this drug at this time in pregnancy at six weeks, then you can interfere with normal heart development. Alcohol affects the brain, and mm -hmm. the brain is developing throughout the entire pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So to say that it's harmless or that we know that it's harmless to consume alcohol in the third trimester, mm -hmm. you still have substantial brain growth taking place um, during that period of time. Mm -hmm. So there really isn't a time when uh, we think um, that it's uh, known to be safe to consume alcohol. 
I think it's very important to spread this as, as now I'm a few weeks away from delivering baby yeah. boy and I've been taking hypnobirthing classes. Oh, cool. And even within those classes, they recommend when you're in labor, you know, to have a big glass of wine yeah. to calm down. Yeah. And you're saying definitely don't do that. I think Not the, even in I labor. Think the recommendation, I mean, years ago, mm -hmm. they used to give alcohol drips to prevent preterm labor. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so we've come a long way. Right. I think that's the, we, we the, real difficult situation is um, that we really don't know right, so what a why, safe amount is, why so why do risk? it? Yeah, yeah, there's so many other ways to yeah. calm down. Okay. Um, uh, I love epigenetics. It's just such a fascinating field. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Interest is growing rapidly, so if you could speak to some of the latest information, the latest okay. science coming out on epigenetics okay. as it relates to FASD, can we turn these genes on and off? Okay. So epigenetics is a hot topic in the field of FASD, um, as it is in a lot of areas, mm -hmm. and for uh, probably three reasons. One is, um, uh, is can we um, develop a marker um, for an affected child that's based on their epigenetic profile, so their gene expression profile. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a couple of studies that have been published and more on the way looking at the epigenetic profile, you know, uh, methylation status, genes turned on or off in children with FASD to see is this a, a way that we can use this as a biomarker mm -hmm. to help identify kids, especially in the situation where we have children where we're just not able to document the prenatal exposure, and that's true in a lot of adoptive situations oh, where sure. it's not, you, the mother, you biological know, mother's not available and you don't know. Um, so that's one reason, and we're, we've also looked at it in mothers. Can you use an epigenetic profile in the mother during pregnancy to help identify whether or not her child will be affected? And we just uh, completed a pilot study on that last year that suggests that that may be the case, that this could be a really important biomarker that will help us know which children should be targeted for early intervention from day one. Um, it's also it's helpful. It is helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's also important in terms of understanding the mechanism. So how does alcohol, you ask the question, why is alcohol so much worse than cocaine? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to understand what the mechanisms are. So And how the body metabolizes it. it. Exactly. And thinking about the, uh, the rampantness of the MTHFR genetic mm -hmm. mutation, where mm -hmm. what is it, 50% of the population mm -hmm. isn't methylating, their mm -hmm. detoxif detoxification pathways are clogged in the liver. Yes. Alcohol has to be processed by the liver. Exactly. Are there other correlations between MTHFR and FASD? Yeah, it, that particular um, uh, polymorphism hasn't been looked at, but this is getting into the biochemistry of it. Um, higher homocysteine levels yeah. um, are seen in uh, mothers who drink uh, large amounts of alcohol. Sure. So it sort of stands so to reason bread. it's in that pathway. We're leading the, the breadcrumb trail here yeah. as, as we get down. Yeah. Okay, so um, before we talk about um, nine months matter, um, we, we do, do you feel complete about the, the research on nutritional supplementation? Is there anything else you wanted to say in terms of yeah. increasing certain minerals or trace minerals? There have been um, animal studies that have suggested zinc and iron are important. Um, in the study that I mentioned where we did the intervention in women uh, during pregnancy, we went with a full multivitamin mineral supplement mm -hmm. with the idea that we wanted to sort of um, not go in one by one and have to repeat the study right. 10 times over to look at individual micronutrients, but rather try to look at overall um, improvement of, of the nutrient status of the mother. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have a really good prenatal. Exactly which we, um, we've got you covered, we'll link to those. Um, okay, is there anything else in terms of ways to detect FASD prenatally already before baby's even yeah. born or, or tests that can predict it in infancy so mm -hmm. you don't have to wait till first grade? Mm -hmm. There, um, the, I mentioned the epigenetic study um, and there are some others looking at markers of inflammation um, in mothers uh, in terms of trying to be able to better identify which children are more likely to be affected. Um, of course, 
the most important thing is to, to determine or try to get best information about whether or not the child's been exposed. Um, so the, if the exposure has taken place, then maybe that's the most important thing is to know who should be evaluated as carefully as possible mm -hmm. um, after they're born. Once the baby's born, we're looking at a lot of new things that can really identify the kinds of deficits these children have as young as six months. Experimentally, uh, we've tested uh, a couple of different paradigms for helping identify children at an early age and they're um, use very simple pieces of equipment and just measure uh, the child's heart rate going up and down when they see a new uh, novel stimulus so a picture or hear a tone mm -hmm. um, and the way that they respond to that is can be very characteristically different in children with prenatal alcohol exposure um, and mm. as I said can be done um, as early as six months of age so we think that's a very promising direction to go and doesn't require a huge amount of expertise on, on the part of the person who has to interpret it, so really could be uh, pushed out into um, uh, pediatric type settings throughout the world. I love it. That's yeah. wonderful. Okay, before we get to Nine Months Matter and wrap up, we, we were just discussing earlier about breastfeeding, mm -hmm. and you think, oh, I've been not drinking for nine months to a year. I'm really looking forward now to a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. So what's the impact on breastfeeding mm -hmm. and how much is okay? Mm -hmm. Do we have to pump and dump? Do we have to filter the breast milk? Mm -hmm. It's This is an area of interest of mine, and I think there hasn't been a lot of research done um, in mm -hmm. this uh, vein. And I, we do know, obviously, that alcohol gets into breast milk, and sometimes the recommendation that you hear is, um, to kind of use the, the DUI uh, kind of uh, oh, uh, under point yeah, 08. that you that you uh, want to wait a couple of hours after you've had a drink or for every drink that you have uh, before mm -hmm. you breastfeed. Mm -hmm. um, I think the real question is um, uh, clearly the baby through breast milk um, is not wouldn't be getting the same amount of alcohol as they would be getting crossing the placenta if mm -hmm. the mom drank the same amount of alcohol. But is there an effect? Mm -hmm. And I think that really hasn't been well answered yet. Um, there have been a couple of studies um, from years past, and we're actually working on a study now at UCSD uh, to try to look at are there even subtle neurobehavioral right. um, uh, consequences um, depending on how much you drink and, and how much of the child's nutrition is coming from breast milk. So I don't, I don't think it's a zero risk uh, uh, prop. Maybe better safe than sorry. And, wait, and that may wait be, you know, yeah, to, to breastfeed after, wait to nurse after drinking. I would say cleanse the breast milk with 1500 milligrams of chlorella, uh, right, to, to filter it. Yeah, or don't drink if you can help it. Yeah. Okay, so what about nine months matter? That is the prevention campaign, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. So tell us about Nine Months Matter and how we can get involved and, mm -hmm. and spread the word mm -hmm. um, for women before they get pregnant. Mm -hmm. So uh, this takes us back full circle to the concept that here we're talking about all of this work that has been done to try to understand how to treat children, how to identify children, mm -hmm. and really the answer to this question is don't have it happen in the first place. Right. So if we could prevent this, uh, imagine um, the huge amount of uh, uh, headache, heartache um, mm -hmm. that families go through right. uh, based on this. Um, in what we think is one to five percent of the population that is huge and it's completely preventable mm -hmm. so nine months matter is an initiative to, to try to get that word out and why it is I don't understand it why it is that we failed <laughs> in um, in getting that message across or, or why it is that people's behavior um, is so hard to change um, in this regard um, that's what nine months matter is about is trying to determine what are the best ways that we can raise awareness about this help women who need help uh, to be able to um, have the correct facts mm -hmm. and also know how they can uh, manage uh, to, to change behavior or, or modify their behavior in anticipation of a pregnancy. Um, so it's a collaboration uh, between a, a, a lot of caring people who are willing to do fundraising um, and uh, to engage in campaigns um, to get the, uh, the word out. Yeah, we need national coverage yeah. um, to really get the word out on the mainstream. Media. Absolutely. Um, and, well, and, a, and a consistent message um, mm -hmm. that, that people will get behind. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so what, what are your final, any final 
thoughts for our viewers? Anything final that you want to share? Um, I think that um, alcohol consumption is pervasive in our society. Um, mm -hmm. It's not going to go away and it has a lot of positive benefits. Um, and so it's like in your area, it's like eating. We're not going to stop eating. We want to eat um, in a responsible and healthful way. Mm -hmm. um, so it, uh, the take home messages are um, know the facts about alcohol. And I think the biggest take home message is if you drink, um, don't plan to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, um, if you plan to get pregnant, don't drink. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you. <laughs> You've been watching Food is Medicine TV, our interview series. Make sure you visit the blog where we have links to all of this research and even more. We've, we're linking to all of our healthy mocktails and things that you can do to still enjoy some festive drinks without alcohol and pregnancy. So we'll catch you next time on Food is Medicine TV.